Okay, longhouses. Who was it last month that asked about the longhouse? Who made the suggestion? Does anybody want to admit to it? It was me. Me and my pending poem, there's no shame in the longhouse. Ah, <laughs> well, you've, you've actually got us a pretty good topic here, I think, tonight. <clears throat> Might show us a few things that some of us have never really ventured to think about. So longhouses, <clears throat> part one. Next week, we'll, or next week, well, I wish we could do this almost weekly, but that would be a job. But next month, we'll do part two, which will go inside the longhouse and take a look at what happened there. But this month, we're going to take a look at the longhouse, where it came from, just some basics of what the longhouse was and what it consisted of. <clears throat> so our objectives is kind of a few questions to begin with. Can you have a longhouse without a village? Can you have a village without a longhouse? Do they go hand in hand? Uh, when was the first longhouse? And then we'll take a look at the longhouse and a few of the most important features regarding it. And the longhouse, many of them had palisades. They had palisades for protection, but what was it protecting against? And a question to end everything is, did our post-dispersal ancestors ever live in a longhouse once they left the Ontario homelands? <clears throat> our name is very important. And our name could easily be a name for all the Iroquoian people. Actually, there should be really no Iroquoian people out there because it has nothing to do with any of the Iroquoian nations. It's a name made up by the Europeans for all we know. The name Wyandotte should actually be a name that the Iroquoian people are known by because our name translates into English as the villagers. And there you can see a little clipping from Dr. Barbeau's handwritten dictionary that he prepared in 1911, 1912 that shows one dot. And yes, nowadays we've taken a little Tyndall off the, the second A, but it's left on there because that's how he initially wrote it. And there you can see that Dr. Barbeau uh, taking the <clears throat> The information provided by our elders in 19, 1911, 1912, and identified that Wyandotte means villagers. So it's a very important name, and it appropriately identifies all Iroquoian people. And taking a look at all of the elements that make up an Iroquoian village, <clears throat> to truly identify an Iroquoian village, you have to have almost all of these elements to make a village. And it begins with fields of corn and other crops that are working in tandem with the palisade to surround and encompass the village. The palisade provides some form of protection with that ring of protection. There are smaller buildings and huts along with the long houses that were various sizes. And one of the most important things that goes with an Iroquoian village is the metro, lo metro local people that were related by clan and they were mutually protected by the longhouses and the palisades. Quick little illustration that kind of gives an idea of what a village may have looked like back in the good old days. And this would have been a rather large village of the Iroquoian people. And this is a presentation regarding the Iroquoian people and not the Wyandotte people in specific. So some of this information is just generically applied to all the Iroquoian peoples. The village, we have to back up a little bit and get an idea of what a village is in, in Ontario. The village in Ontario our homeland, specifically southern Ontario, around the banks of Lake Ontario, were not all villages of Iroquois people. And all the villages that came about 
uh, within the archaeological record took processes up to hundreds of years to develop from little macro band campsites that began to emerge around 400 BC all the way through 500 AD. These little groups of people came together, formed these campsites where they uh, joined forces, if you will, for multiple things. And we'll take a look at here in a second what some of those were. But these initial macro band campsites began to form these villages. And these villages would disperse back into their smaller bands during the winter months where they would keep the small bands together in, the, in their small inclusive camps. In time, bands of these people would stay together in these macro band sites and began to form semi-permanent villages. But all of this was taking place long before the Iroquoian people showed up. So these villages began to build and they were non-Iroquoian in development. The three sisters played a large role in the development of these villages. Agriculture, food production was a primary drive along with trade, ceremonies, mutual protection, and the finding of a mate um, created these macro camps. In time, the production that was being made from corn accounted for 50 to 80% of the calories that these people were uh, ingesting. Other crops included beans, sunflower, squash, and tobacco, which all of these are also equally important to us. The people they hunted, they gathered foods of various kinds that was more prevalent in the area where they were living. The geography played a big portion of it. And two, the people's preference. Some of the people preferred different things. For instance, uh, the Huron Wendat, because of where they were located, they were kind of landlocked between the Georgian Bay and Lake Simcoe. Fish was a primary portion of their diet. It provided a big portion of the protein. In contrast, the Adewanderonk, from where we came, um, they existed more on the western shore of Lake Ontario, where white-tailed deer was more prevalent. So where the people lived is kind of what they actually used for their primary food sources. An important complex to look at, or a little culture, is the Princess Point. The Princess Point complex is located near Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, right on the western shore of Lake Ontario. And this complex has been dated between 260 to 660 AD, maybe even going up into the realms of 1000 AD, the archeologic, archeologic, I had problems with that earlier today. The people who dig in dirt have problems trying to determine when a lot of these complexes, these civilizations, these cultures emerged. So there's a lot of debate on this Prince Point complex. And it's important because this is the last non-Ontario Iroquoian tradition to be found within the archeological record. The reason for that is there is no clear evidence of longhouses that exist within the archeological record. And important for us is that within the same general area, the Glen Meyer tradition began to emerge and it is a true Iroquoian tradition with longhouses. And it's generally accept, accepted, but still debated that the Ontario Iroquoian tradition began somewhere around 900 AD. And it's assumed that a migration took place, some form of a conquest occurred and expulsion or adoption of the area's original inhabitants occurred. Because if you remember before, it took almost a thousand years for these villages to begin to form within the, the Ontario archeological record. And here at the Point Princess area, just almost overnight, all of a sudden these people started building longhouses. A very complex, very difficult, a form of architecture was now prevalent throughout the archeological record. And nobody knows how that happened. It's very odd that just boom, overnight longhouses appear. 
Uh, maybe some form of a little uh, village could have been done with some smaller, uh, more rudimentary forms of, of habitation, but longhouses are very difficult to construct. Uh, just a little side note, does anybody else, does anybody know what's going on within the Great Island or who showed up at the Great Island about the same time around 900, 1000 AD as the Iroquois people did? Who else shows up in North America about the same time? Anybody want to take a guess? The Vikings? Absolutely, the Vikings. Yeah, the Northmen, Vikings, whatever we want to call them, Scandinavians. And what was their primary mode of habitation? What did they live in? Longhouses. Long. Yeah. Is it coincidental that about the same time that the Iroquoian people show up on the Great Island, the archaeological record also showed that the Vikings showed up? It makes you wonder if there's any connection there somehow. That might be something to look into one of these days. But Iroquoian villages pop into the archaeological record seemingly out of nowhere. These villages of various sizes show up and they all consist of longhouses and palisades. And the little illustration here can kind of show you how these longhouses were organized within the protective boundary of the palisades. Uh, they just didn't have a set pattern to the way these villages were organized. They showed up in all different forms, all different alignments. No north, south, east or west was sacred how they basically fit into the village, fit the terrain and fit the geography and fit the way that the winds blew. The longhouse, the village, all of that can be defined as a true village when the longhouses fit within inside the palisades that is greater than an acre in size. The populations within these villages varied from a few hundred people up to several thousand citizens. And because of the tax that was played upon the, the area, they had to re relocate the villages about every five to 20 years, depending upon the size of that village. And it's estimated that at the time of European contact, these villages were supporting up to 100,000 Northern Iroquoians. Uh, they were very prosperous and they were very adept at making sure that the people were well fed and taken care of. Two illustrations here show two villages of varying sizes and how they kind of had a layout. Uh, you can look at this later when you get the, uh, the slides from um, <clears throat> emailed to you. But the Elliott site is a large village and a portion of it is missing because of erosion. But if you can imagine that other portion kind of coming out over into this area here, it would be even bigger than what we see on this, this illustration of the archeological record compared to the Praying Mana site, which was a very small village. And they all had different sizes, different numbers of longhouses. The longhouses were permanent structures within the village. Once they built them, they stayed. Usually the only time that a longhouse would have been rebuilt would have been if it burnt down. If it was needed to expand into a different longhouse because of, of the addition of people, uh, it just kind of grew in dynamic within the, the longhouse itself and it wasn't built or added to or anything. What they built to begin with is what they stayed with. The longhouse was a frame of poles, obviously. Uh, that was buried deep into the soil and covered with white cedar, American elm, or ash. The bark was just laid in big sheaths across the, the poles and provided a good barrier from the weather. Roofs came in different sizes, different, not sizes, but different shapes. They could have been arched, angled, or semi-flat. And the longhouse averaged 21 to 24 feet in width. And it was as wide as it was tall. And the reason that these longhouses were tall 
uh, up to 21 to 24 feet in height is because the height allowed for the minimization with smoke because these longhouses would have been full of smoke from the fires. Longhouses averaged 65 feet in length, but there were some that reached out to 100 to 200 feet in length. Those were massive. And alongside these big longhouses and average size longhouses were small cabin-like structures about 13 feet in length. And it's believed that these small structures were used for various things such as uh, people coming through the village, just traveling through, they would have stayed inside of a, a, a cabin-like structure. If they had any relation, clan relation to some of those that were in the longhouses, they may have stayed there. And it's also believed that some of these cabin-like structures would have been the place that the women may have stayed during the time that they had their periods, during the time of the month, because they separated themselves from the general population during that time. Longhouses that were housed by the village chief. And if you can remember from a month or two back, we talked about every single village had its own appointed chief. And their longhouse would have been constructed much larger to accommodate meetings, community feasts, and ceremonies so that all the people could come together in one place. Longhouses, they have found in the archaeological record that there was painted either in black or red, an anthropomorphic or zoomorphic figure on the outside of the longhouse that would have identified the female lineage or the clan spirit of that longhouse. Every single one of the longhouses would have been through a certain female lineage or they would have been a certain clan that inhabited that, that longhouse. Of course, there would have been other people of different clans, mates of the primary longhouse would have been also in there. So there were multiple clans in the single longhouse, but it was dominated by a certain female and her clan. Doors were placed on both ends of the longhouse so people could come and go at will. Uh, they were open to all clan citizens, to all citizens of the village, regardless of their clan. The palisade, the palisade completely enclosed the village unless it sat on the edge of a cliff or the, the, the next the side of a river where the palisade could not completely circle it. If it sat on top of a hill, completely encase the village. But prior to the arrival of the Europeans, the palisade was not necessary for, for the village defense because tactics of war did not necessarily entertain that a army would come and attack a village and lay siege to it like we saw in Europe. So why were these palisades placed around these villages when there was no need for them to protect from an enemy. Uh, the palisade was a dividing line between the community and the wilds found within nature, including the spirits that were within nature. And in time, many of the larger villages did build defensive features, um, multi-road wooden palisades that were more of a maze to get down inside the heart of the village. Uh, protected the village along with earthworks. Uh, there are some that have like moats, uh, little, little hills that people would have had to have um, traversed in order to get to the village. Then they would have hit the, the palisade. And then the building on top of a hill or a bluff would have also been a defensive barrier. The palisade and the longhouse were tangible elements of an Iroquois community, the village. They were very important, more so than what we can imagine today. The palisade and the longhouse were as much spiritual entities as they were tangible entities. Many things that were associated with the, the spiritual lives of the people that lived in the village uh, was performed inside the longhouse and inside the protection of the palisade. And next month, we'll talk just a little bit more about that and see how important that palisade and longhouse was to the people. The spirit of the beaver, if you can remember, we have a beaver clan, which is now extinct. 
but the spirit of the beaver gave her clan the knowledge to construct all the people's homes and the palisades for protection from the wilds of nature and the evil spirits. Each one of the clans had their own particular role within society, and the beaver clan um, may have played a role within the building of these, these palisades and the longhouses. They had the ability to construct these monumentally large dwellings that played an important role in the people's lives. And our oral traditions speak of how there was protection in the numbers of people that were within the, the villages and how the stone giants feared to enter the villages and the longhouses to prey upon the people. So the village and the palisade played a dynamic role within the lives of the people on a daily basis. Now, the question, after the dispersal of 1652, did our Huron Wyandotte ancestors live in longhouses? We know for certain that the ancestors, that our ancestors lived in longhouses before the dispersal, but after 1652, when we were driven from the Ontario homeland, did we ever build any more longhouses and live in them? Yes or no? Who wants to guess? I'm going to say no. Uh, this is busy. I'm going to say no. Okay. Has anybody you, you else? already told us yes, because they built them outside of, in, outside of the fort. Oh, very well, good. I, I hadn't quite divulged that yet. Um, I didn't say that our ancestors did, but yes, they did. Ah, uh, there you yep. go. I um, stand corrected. There is not a lot of historical data that talks about the longhouses that our grandparents would have built post-dispersal. Uh, for a long, long time, I believe that we probably did not build a longhouse because we were constantly on the move. We were here, we were there. Uh, we were being chased by our Iroquoian cousins, the Haudenosaunee, and we didn't really have time to put down any long roots. However, I was wrong. Uh, there is a, this is an extract from a personal diary dated from Fort Detroit in 1718. And the author of this is anonymous. But this, this French gentleman, if you will, was making his rounds through North America and he stops New France and he stops in Detroit and he makes a, this is just a small portion of his, his diary. And he makes a long assessment of what he saw in Detroit. And he mentioned the Hurons, which at that time we were known as the Hurons. And he talks about everything that he can visually see and how impressive the Hurons were. Um, the thing that he mentions here is they construct their huts completely of bark, entirely of bark, very strong and solid, very lofty and very long and arched like arbors. Their fort is strongly encircled with pickets and bastions, well redoubled, and has strong gates. So this gentleman, whomever he was, described pretty clearly that we built longhouses. He indicated that they were lofty, they were very tall, and they were very long, and they had arched roofs on them. And they were surrounded by a fort with pickets and bastions. And there are also some, now that I've done more research, there's also some additional references that do confirm this, that there were others who did write about the, the, the Hurons, um, longhouses and the villages being surrounded by the, the Palisades. So yes, we did have a longhouse after we were dispersed from Ontario. However, a few years later, around 1747, when uh, the census was taken, there's no mentioning of the longhouses. So in time, they fell out of favor and all of our grandparents began to build cabins and live in more um, very close family, uh, immediate family relations. 
So next month, we'll talk more about what happened inside of the Longhouse, uh, both from the personal aspects of, of just living there and what some of the more spiritual connotations would have been with the significance of that, that Longhouse. And to give everybody who would like some additional reading material for the next month, there are some sources here that you can uh, get your hands on and get a lot more information because what I shared here is just a drop in the bucket to more information that's out there on the longhouses. So that's all that I have for this month. Awesome. Looks like Amanda has a question for you, though. Okay. She's got to unmute herself, though. There she is. Got to unmute, darling. I muted you earlier. Unmute. I muted everybody. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. It was me just trying to look at what everybody else was saying. It was not a question. I apologize. I'm a grandma. I don't know how to work technology. So sorry. <laughs> no worries. So any right. other questions? Can, okay. Now, okay, she now I do have a question. I'm sorry. Um, what was the dispersal of 1652? I'm sorry. I didn't, I don't know what that is. Um, 1652, um, some people give other dates anywhere from 1650, 1652. The dispersal that took place out of Ontario with our, our three parent nations would have occurred at the time in which the Haudenosaunee attacked the nations of the neutral confederacy. And from that initial attacks, a series of attacks, all of the neutral nations would have been either destroyed or they would have been dispersed and adopted into the, the conquering nations of the Haudenosaunee. We had our three parent nations that refused to accept adoption into the, the Haudenosaunee, and they fled westward. They went with the primarily the Ottawa up into the area of Mackinac Bay and stayed there for a little while before they were driven even further into Wisconsin, where they stayed until they had a massive confrontation with the, uh, the Sioux people. But it was a dispersal from Ontario after the Haudenosaunee totally destroyed the, the Wendats. And then they came in and destroyed the neutrals as well. Hello. Lloyd, how, how extensive was the agriculture around each of these uh, villages? I assume it was outside of the Palisades. If we can go back up here to this picture, get that chat out of the way. <coughs> this picture here, can everybody still see the screen? Yeah. Or, or I've got my ugly face on there. Let me stop the, the video and see if we can go back to the screen. It's up there. It's up there. Oh, it is. Okay. Well, the, the little illustration here shows some of the the agriculture that was on the outside of the palisade. And there are some of the reports that the Jesuits made that speak of how there were acres and acres and acres and acres, countless acres of corn and other crops that just completely surrounded these villages for miles. And the amount of corn production that it would have taken, knowing that it was up to 50 to 80% of their total consumption would have been significant. How many acres it was, I don't know exactly how many it, it would have compiled, but it would have been a large amount of land usage that it would have taken to support these larger villages. But it just literally encompassed the whole of these villages for, for several miles in some directions. Corn, bean squash being the primary ones. They would have used the, 
the general area around the villages for all the agriculture uses. And that's why they had these, these areas beyond that they went and did all their hunting in. They had their, their hunting lands that were shared by other nations. And that's where they brought back all the deer, uh, all the other uh, animals that they would have harvested. And most of the villages were also built right next to the, the rivers that gave them access for, uh, for, uh, for trade throughout the, the, the Ontario region and far beyond. I suspect the river land was better for crops as well. A lot of river bottom would have been ideal for the, the growing of the crops, yes. And Ontario, uh, it's, it's a cornucopia. They had plenty of just naturally occurring uh, food sources that were in great abundance. And it was the corn um, that actually allowed these villages to stay in one place for up to 20, 20 years that allowed them to actually sustain themselves through the cost of production of that corn. Okay, I think Cece's next. Maybe you covered this and I missed it, but in this photo you have up on the screen here, on the left-hand side of the palisade, there's there's a gap, there's a um, portion of the fencing and then there's a gap. Is that, does that serve a purpose? <laughs> Most of these palisades, once they got to the point where they became defensive structures, would have been multiple layers of, of fencing of palisades. And those multiple layers were described in some cases of being almost like a maze. They would have given the ability for uh, an, an attacking enemy if they actually penetrated to come into like a little courtyard that you see there, which on the back side of the other side of the fence would have been the archers. They would have had these little platforms that they could have stood upon. When the enemies would have come into these little courtyards, they would have just started shooting them with bow and arrow. So they did provide extra areas of defense so that they could actually shoot down the enemy inside these enclosed areas. It was kind of like a, a fencing of the enemies into their, their, their control. And if you look there on that little illustration, you can see that there is on this one, a double layer of fencing that completely surrounded the whole of the village. Has anybody not seen Black Robe? And if you haven't seen Black Robe, have you watched it recently? Has, Sorry. <laughs> has everybody seen Black Robe? It's been a long time ago. I mean, a long time ago. Uh, Black Robe's not perfect, but it is, it's, a, it's a really, really good movie that shows a lot of things as historically accurate as they possibly can get. And when they show the, the people that had been captured in the group along with the, the Jesuit being taken into the, the Haudenosaunee village, it showed them going into and through the palisade and through the, the maze work of that palisade. And it was very complex. It was almost like a trap. So if you haven't had a chance to see Black Robe uh, recently, um, take some time and watch it because it does show pretty clearly how these villages were well protected with that palisade. And that little area there was, was built into most of the, the villages as an area to, of just shoot them. Sorry to interrupt. Is that a movie? Yes, Black Robe, it is. yes. Okay, what year did it come out? I think I'm just really young. I don't never heard of it. Uh, 91, 1991. I that I was two. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> well, it's it's very good. It's it's very accurate in its historical presentation, but there are some scenes in it that don't really line up to tradition. And if you watch it, do know that there are some pretty raw scenes in it too it's it's an adult it's an adult grade movie okay mm -hmm. all right i think marilyn had the next question okay 
I actually have three. So does somebody else want to go first? Three? I, I, yes, I do. Only wow. three? You're doing good, <laughs> Marilyn. Only three. I know. I'm. I, you're shocked. You're slipping, Marilyn. <laughs> well, you know, once I ask those, you'll say something that I have to ask another question. Yeah, most likely. Okay, I'll go. I'll go. Yeah, so, please. Okay, uh, so on the palisades with the fences and the doors, I'm thinking that you don't just go through the door of one fence and then go through the second door, the layers. They would the wouldn't the doors be offset so that you couldn't just drive right through? You'd have to do a lot of jogging and go in front of those archers. Well, they were specifically designed for in later years for protective purposes. So yeah, it was, it was, it was described as a maze. There would not been a straight front door opening and then straight into the heart of the, of the village. They would have had to have gone through different, different areas in order to gain access. So yeah, you're right. It would not have been a straight shot in. Uh, once they gone through like the area that the door at the gate was here, then the, the gate might have been back down here or back over here someplace to actually go in and enter the village. So yeah, you're correct. Okay. Question number two, you mentioned Hamilton, Ohio, or Ontario, and so I kind of Googled that, and that was where we would have had a longhouse, correct? Well. Or, or where? The, where, the, where the Princess Point complex, which was not Iroquoian, mm -hmm. is right there in that general vicinity of Hamilton. I is do not still know. There? Pardon? It's still there? Um, they have some areas where they've done the archaeological digs that still exist, but the village itself is long gone. Damn. Throughout all of Ontario, there are numerous sites where they've got uh, some archaeological areas that have been preserved that have a lot of evidence of these villages. I mean, they're scattered all throughout Ontario. I'm seeing both, that. Both neutral, Wendat, there's Haudenosaunee, there's all mm -hmm. kinds of villages that are Iroquoian. Um, the maps, when you look at the location of these villages, they're in the middle of some of the large cities. Uh -huh. I mean, my goodness, Toronto used to be in the heart of, of the neutrals claimed land, if you will. Oh my God. So they're, they're everywhere. I was all in that area in 1998 and knew nothing. And we went, when we went from Niagara Falls to, to Ontario, uh, Toronto, we would have went right through Hamilton. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, my kids are probably thinking it was a blessing I didn't know at that time. Okay, my this, next. The small, the small praying mantis. Uh -huh. This this three longhouse village. Uh, it's yeah. in London, London, Ontario. Yeah, we weren't. We didn't go through London, but wow. I've been there. Did cool. you see the the village? Yep. Yeah, it's cool. really cool. Cool. Wow. Maybe I'll get back. Okay, my final question. With all that corn, 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 I guess they didn't have to worry about carbs like we do now. <coughs> Did they not eat a, a, enough to, to really have that issue? Or would they have had, you know, issues back then related to mm -hmm. diabetes and stuff that we have currently well there's a lot of stuff that we eat that we eat right now that attributes to the diabetes more than just corn well true true but i meant the, i just think if they ate a lot of corn you know mm -hmm. like, well if you think about it corn within itself is really not that nutritious it is not a vegetable like a lot of people like to classify it as it's a grain no different than wheat or rice right and they use the corn as a primary source of, of grain. And if you look at what we have in our kitchens today, how much rice and wheat product do we have? 
It's, it's pretty much everywhere. And if they just solely ate the corn by itself, <clears throat> they probably would have been facing a lot of malnourishment because corn is not that nutritious. Mm -hmm. It's filling, but it doesn't sustain you. So they would have had the corn mixed with a lot of other things, corn and beans, corn and squash, uh, corn and venison, corn and fish. I mean, there's some archeological evidence that shows some of these diets were, were corn and fish, corn and, corn and venison. And when they had their corn, they always had it with something else. <clears throat> so they had it corn in almost all their dishes. Every single thing they ate would have had corn, but they complemented it with other things. Well, when you turn it into hominy, it's a lot more uh, nutritious. Correct. Uh, they lose a lot of the, the vitamins and things that are in it, but typically if you just eat straight corn or even ground dried corn, you're still not going to get that until you actually release it with, with yeah. uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce the, the Nick's whatever. So anyway. And two, if you just ate Something venison I, by, I, if you just ate venison by itself, venison has no fat in it. It's it's very low in fat, so you're going to end up having issues with not getting any fats into your diet. That's why our grandmas and grandpas in Michigan and Ohio, their most favorite dish to eat would have been corn. Yes, corn was in everything, but they dipped a lot of their their jerky, their venison jerky, and bear oil, bear grease, and maple syrup, the sugar. So they had to complement what they were getting lack or the lack of getting uh, the oils and the sugars through other sources, which would have been bear oil and maple syrup. That's why maple syrup was such an important commodity for the grandmas and grandpas. That was one of the determining factors when they decided to leave. Ohio was the land that they were going to. Did they have maple trees in that area? Because they had to have their maple sugar and they had to have their bear fat to complement their venison and their corn to make up for the deficiencies that both of them would have given in the diet. The other thing to bear in mind is the variety of corn that was available to them at that time is very, very different than the varieties of corn that we have now. So right. the nutritional content and the protein content in the corn from all those many, many, many years ago could be very different than what we're used to now. Um, there's a really cool movie that I'm going to post up here uh, that talks about the changes in indigenous diets that occurred um, in, in the um, advent of, uh, of um, the Euro-colonial influences. And um, I really recommend everybody seeing it. It's set, a lot of it's contemporary, but there's a lot of information in there about how it is that um, Native American people tend to have issues with diabetes. It has a lot more to do with the changes of um, the, the way we eat and also the way that, um, the, way that the indigenous uh, plants and such were sort of stripped out as um, greater numbers of um, pioneers came in to put farms on the land. Like there might've been a lot of uh, uh, maple trees in Iowa, in Ohio way back then, but there probably weren't uh, nearly as many, um, you know, by about 1850. <laughs> so I'm just presenting the, the conversation about diet has a lot more to do with the changes in um, the indigenous landscape that, that our ancestors lived in. Um, if I could jump in there just a little bit, um, corn maize uh, was developed considerably by the time the Wyandots got to it. It developed from a wild strain of plant in South America. And the, the carbohydrate in corn uh, is a little harder to break down than the simple carbohydrates we get in cornmeal and flour, uh, wheat flour, those kinds of things. Uh, we process all of those with an enzyme called amylase, and it breaks the um, starch fiber into uh, sugar molecules, if you will. So um, 
there's plenty of carbohydrate. It's a little more complex. It takes longer to break down as opposed to our modern diet where we tend to consume a great deal of simple carbohydrate and it um, spikes our, um, our system, particularly in the uh, insulin. So um, corn has, has evolved quite a bit. Some of the modern corn actually is higher in protein, uh, probably for livestock, not for us, but um, it, it's still, um, it, it provides a basic carbohydrate on which to build with the animal protein, animal fats, and um, gives a great deal of energy. Probably the main thing I've ever read is that the introduction of corn increased the amount of dental caries meaning it affected people's teeth. Mm -hmm. So that's just a little bit about corn. Um, sorry, sorry if I went overboard there. That teaching agriculture, it's one of those things that I had to know about. Can I add one little bit? <laughs> From a nutritional standpoint, biochemically, our bodies need those carbohydrates to, to finalize our um, chemical processes for breaking down protein as, and fat as well. So there's a lot of biochemistry within our body that's that's required. So they would have needed that corn along with those vegetables to process the meat and fish that they were utilizing. And also those are the only types of um, nutrients that are broken down into, um, into glycogen and stored within your muscle tissues for immediate um, action, which is necessary. Yay, you're making this science teacher very, very happy. <laughs> I, suspect awesome. they, I suspect they needed to be more ready for immediate action than we are <laughs> <laughs> true true that's a good point i need a lot of studying to understand a lot of that. <laughs> awesome was that all your questions marilyn it is awesome it, it went into a great discussion there it really did it really did well, Janet has a question also, so I want to make sure we have time for that. Um, has everyone else had their question? Like, I don't want to go ahead of anyone, though. No, I'm not on mute. Uh, You're good. You're good. Okay, thanks. So I just wanted to thank Lloyd and thank everyone. My name's Janet. I'm from Toronto. I have Wendat ancestry. Um, I just have to say, in response to that, the wind out were all wiped out. They weren't totally wiped out. They they did go to Quebec, and the, and you guys know like Linda Siwi and them. I haven't met her yet, but Catherine Tamaro's gonna hook me up hopefully, because I want to meet the wind outs out in Quebec. Oh I yeah. I wanted to know if anyone here knows anything because like I'm <laughs> learning from Anishinaabe oral history and everyone knows or everyone says that we were driven out not only by the Haudenosaunee but Isaac Murdoch he's really hooked up with oral history he um in his family and he said that uh, even the Anishinaabe pushed us out and he said, I feel guilty because I was talking about land back up at Georgian Bay. And he said, that's a good idea because I even feel guilty because we we drove you guys out too. And I said, like, why? And he said, all awkwardly, go cannibalism. And he goes, but we were all doing it. And I'm like, I wonder why we were known for doing it more so than everyone else. And I wanted to know if anyone has any leads on that because I'm fascinated I kind of almost want to do a PhD on this like and the corn cannibalism thing, like Phil Cote <laughs> hold on just a sec Phil Cote is another historian and he says that the Anishinaabe were here like in Ontario for a million years and the one dot were invited up because we were good at diplomacy and we've been here for 8,000 years. So that goes past like these longhouse archeological digs, right? But I'm wondering, cause I keep getting dreams about Veracruz. And it's like, are we connected to the Aztecs who also 
had cannibalistic ceremony you know like I just wanted to put those ideas out there yeah. you know and wonder if there are Wyandotte oral historians there there is no records of our ancestors embracing cannibalism the so only you guys thing say, no we didn't do that at all well there's kind of a little little facet that might still uh, require the definition of cannibalism being given to the wine dot people and to back up a little bit the Haudenosaunee destroyed the Wendat confederacy they did not destroy the Wendat people because yeah we're we're all very much aware that they are still in Quebec and very much alive and well but the the cannibalism that the other nations in the area was full cannibalism. They ate people, everything. And our closest friends for the longest time, the Ottawa were ones that actually involved themselves with cannibalism and it was repulsive to our, our people. The only thing that there is any record when it comes to cannibalism that can be given to the wine dots, and it's kind of more predispersal than post dispersal, is the eating of a combatant's heart. There is mm -hmm. some evidence that the Iroquoian people would eat a combatant's heart in order to gain the attributes, the power, the strengths, the spirituality that they possessed, but to actually eat any other um, muscle, arm, leg, whatever. I am not aware that we actually participated at that level in cannibalism. It was not something that the Iroquoian people embraced. It was repulsive to most Iroquoian nations. But most of our friends and allies around us, most of the other Algonquians, you know, the Ottawa, Potawatomi, Chippewa, they all actively participated in cannibalism. I wonder why we got the bad rap then. Um, if you look at a lot of the, the history that's written about the Iroquoian people, uh, primarily from the perspective of the Haudenosaunee, uh, the Haudenosaunee, they were, they, were, they were amazing. There was nothing else in North America that could have stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with them on a battlefield and won, us included. The way that they were raised, the way that they actually fought on the battlefield was phenomenal. However, we did defeat them. And the power that they possessed has been inundated in the history books because of their phenomenal deeds in war. And in North America, Central America, South America, the only other nation that gets that type of recognition is the Aztec. And I do not ever believe that I've seen that there's any connection between the Iroquoian people and the Aztec people. There's been a few that's tried to make that connection, but we have an oral tradition uh, from, um, can't think of his first name right now, a walker. Um, talked about him a couple of weeks, months ago. Uh, just going blank with his first name, but there is an oral tradition that tries to um, deny the fact that we have that connection to the Aztec, because he says in his oral, in his tradition that he wrote, which was one of the WPA interviews, that we had no connection with the people south of the, um, oh goodness, <laughs> south of Mexico, in Mexico area the Rio Grande. So there is no connection to the Aztecs with the Wyandotte people. All right, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. What else? Fun trying to put everything into a greater context. So let's see. Oh, yep, yeah, Betty Zane. Yes. Your hand's still up. Is it still up? Well, I'll use it. Uh, I didn't, I meant to take it down. Oh. Um, but, but I did want to say that um, 
there is a really interesting book that is um, that I've I haven't fully read it. I've just kind of skimmed it. Uh, it's the um, Huron when the feast of the dead, and it talks in there about the um, the burial pits that were created, and that there was a ritual that was done where the bones would be cleansed uh, prior to being put in the um, in the uh, communal uh, grave. And it could be that some event such as that um, was misconstrued by some observer who thought we were, you know, making making grandma stew or something. But, what? Um, misconstrued by outsiders? Yeah, Never. or perhaps. Shocked. <laughs> I'm totally, totally shocked that that could ever, ever happen. Right. The uh, Jesuits were you. mortified by that. It just absolutely terrified them to see the Feast of the Dead play out. Well, and we yeah. actually we carried the Feast of the Dead with us out of the Ontario homelands and mm -hmm. actually actively participated in it for many, many years afterwards. It was not unique to the Wendat people. Nope. Mm -mm. It was unique well, to all, most all the Iroquoian people in whole. Yeah, yeah Betty Zane in the uh that uh, Wendat Feast of the Dead book by mm -hmm. Mark C. Um, he talks about how the Jesuits actually understood it because they would take like saints and boil them down and disperse their bones around. Mm -hmm. So that they weren't really, they were more accepting of it than you would have thought. Right. Is, was my take from the book. Right. One of the things that I had read was that one of the reasons why they removed the the flesh from the bones was that um, there was a belief that the that the the soul, the spirit life of of an individual dwelt in their bones, but not in in um, not in their in their flesh. And I think that's kind of a, a, a very poetic uh, thought that the that the the meat and the meat and the organs represented your your time on this earth in this lifetime in this in this um i'll be, forgive me if i use the word incarnation um but that the bones remained and the bones um decom you know the bones became a part of the earth again and um and uh, and the, and in that and in that so did the spirit live on just just you know like i said it's there's a beautiful poetry to it so and that that tradition was actually last fulfilled just before we left Ohio, before we left Upper Sandusky, because when Samum Dewat was was killed in the he was assassinated in the in the Black Swamp, before we left uh, Upper Sandusky, people went back to the site where he was buried in the Black Swamp, and they retrieved his bones mm -hmm. and those of his niece and nephew. And they return those bones uh, to the cemetery that's just right behind the the church, and reburied them there so that they could rest with the other wine dots that were mm -hmm. in the cemetery. So that tradition, even though it's been, you know, several centuries post dispersal, was still being honored by our grandparents just prior to leaving Ohio. And the tradition kind of changed to the point that. Um, even here in the last several years, uh, the Bland family, my family, will still go to Bland Cemetery, and obviously we no longer have the Feast of the Dead, but the tradition kind of changed a little bit to Feast with the Dead that was described by Reverend Finley. Instead of retrieving the bones of those that had died into a communal area, what they would do is they would go into the cemetery and they would have a feast with their uh, deceased loved ones right there in the cemetery. And the Blands had started doing that again several years ago where we would go and actually have a little picnic in Bland Cemetery with all of our family that has died. So those type of traditions are still alive and still doing very well within the nation. All righty. Any last questions, comments? Now, a couple things. I do believe that Amanda's question about 
human waste and the disposal of is part of next month's topic. Um, when we go into uh, there's no shame in the longhouse. Am mm -hmm. I correct, Lloyd? Um, there was no shame in the longhouse and there was no shame outside of the longhouse. So people did what they did because people do what they do. And we'll talk more about that next month. Awesome. Wanted to be sure. Okay. Here's your chance, folks. We've been going for an hour plus wait time for everyone to be able to join us at the beginning. So if there's anything else you would like to ask, now's the time to do it. I, I think they're saying it's another great, it was another great session tonight. A little bit different tonight, which it's nice that we can venture out and talk about things that we've never really looked at before in the longhouse and, and everything around it is, it's very important for us to still understand today how the, the things that they shared in the longhouse, we can still get together and share many of those that, like the gathering. So hopefully everybody putting a little plug in for the gathering now, hopefully everybody can make it to Wyandotte this year uh, for the first time in two years and come and join us all together at the gathering. It'd be nice to see everybody there. And if you 